What if I told you that a missing 3D number system could change the way we understand mathematics? A system that William Rowan Hamilton overlooked when he skipped directly from complex numbers to quaternions. This missing algebra isn't just a curiosity. It might unlock higher dimensional number systems, including a five-dimensional extension we call quintinions. But before we reach 5D, we must first reconstruct what should have existed in 3D. In this video, we introduce mocabions, a brand new 3D algebra. We will define their structure, prove their multiplication rules, and show why they are fundamentally different from complex numbers, quaternions, and octonions. In 1843, mathematician William Rowan Hamilton attempted to extend complex numbers into three dimensions. He needed a number system that could multiply consistently, rotate vectors smoothly, and support division with well-defined inverses. But every attempt using numbers of the form a plus b times i plus c times j led to contradictions in multiplication. Hamilton abandoned 3D and discovered quaternions, extending numbers into four dimensions, a plus b times i plus c times j plus d times k. But did he truly prove 3D numbers were impossible, or did he just miss a different approach? Today, we take a new path, one that leads directly to the missing 3D algebra. Let's define mocabions. A mocabion is a number of the form a plus b times i plus c times j, where a, b, and c are real numbers, and i and j are imaginary units obeying these rules. i squared equals negative 1, j squared equals negative 1, i times j equals 1, and j times i equals negative 1. Unlike real and complex numbers, mocabions are non-commutative and non-associative because i times j does not equal j times i. This property fundamentally changes how multiplication behaves. To see it in action, let's multiply two mocabions. Before we can multiply two mocabions, we need to understand how multiplication works in an algebra that is both non-commutative and non-associative. In the world of mocabions, we deal with three types of elements, a real number, which we'll call r, and two imaginary units, i and j. These imaginary units follow specific rules. i times j equals one, but j times i equals negative one. This means the order of multiplication matters a lot. Now, suppose we're multiplying three elements together, a real scalar, r, an imaginary unit, i, and another imaginary unit, j. There are six possible ways to arrange these elements during multiplication. These arrangements can be grouped based on the position of what we call the capital F. The capital F is the one that stays anchored in place during multiplication. The other elements, the small f and the real number r, behave differently depending on their positions. Some arrangements are equivalent by symmetry, while others lead to contradictions because of the non-commutative nature of this algebra. Let's define this more clearly. The capital F acts like a multiplicand. It doesn't change position. Think of it as the anchor point in the multiplication process. The small f is the multiplier. It can rotate around the capital F, but its behavior depends on where the capital F is located. The real number behaves, behaves neutrally. It commutes freely unless it's blocked by the capital F in the middle. Here's the first rule, times R times small f equals capital F times small f times R. Here, the capital F is on the left. When the capital F is on the left, the scalar R and the small f can rearrange freely before being multiplied by the capital F. For example, let capital F equal I, small f equal J, and R equal two. First, calculate capital F times R times small f, I times two times J equals I times two J, which simplifies to two times I times J. Since I times J equals one, this becomes two times one, which equals two. Now calculate capital F times small f times R, I times J times two equals I times J two, which simplifies to I times J times two. Again, since i times j equals 1, this becomes 1 times 2, which equals 2. So, capital F times r times small f equals capital F times small f times r. The second rule is similar. r times capital F times small f equals small f times capital F times r. This rule applies when the capital F is at the end. When the capital F is at the end, the scalar r and the small f still commute freely before hitting the capital F. For example, let capital F equal j, small f, small f equal i, and r equal 3. First, calculate r times capital F times small f, three times j times i equals three times j times i. Since j times i equals negative one, this becomes three times negative one, which equals negative three. And now calculate small f times capital F times r, i times j times three equals i times j times three. Again, since i times j equals one, this becomes one times three, which equals three. 
So R times capital F times small f equals small f times capital F times R. The third rule is where things break down. R times capital F times small f does not equal small f times capital F times R. When the capital F is in the middle, the real number R and the small f are on opposite sides. This creates a situation where multiplication is neither associative nor commutative. For example, let R equal 4, capital F equal J, and small f equal I. First, calculate R times capital F times small f. 4 times j times i equals 4 times j times i. Since j times i equals negative 1, this becomes 4 times negative 1, which equals negative 4. Now calculate small f times capital F times r i times j times 4 equals i times j times 4. Since i times j equals 1, this becomes 1 times 4, which equals 4. Clearly, r times capital F times small f does not equal small f times capital F times r. Real numbers do commute and associate with both i and j, but only if they're not split by the capital F. When a capital F blocks the flow, real numbers become directional. Here's a visual rule you can remember. If the capital F is on the left or right, the scalar and small f can rearrange freely. If the capital F is in the middle, the order of multiplication matters and the result may not be the same. This behavior highlights the non-commutative and non-associative nature of Maccabions and shows why they're so different from traditional number systems. Let's take two mocabions. The first one is a1 plus b1 times i plus c1 times j, and the second one is a2 plus b2 times i plus c2 times j. When we multiply them, we use the distributive property, expanding each term step by step. First, we multiply a1 by a2, then a1 by b2 times i, then a1 by c2 times j. Next, we multiply b1 times i by a2, then b1 times i by b2 times i, and so on for all the terms. Now we apply the multiplication rules. i squared equals negative 1, so b1 times i times b2 times i becomes negative b1 times b2. j squared equals negative 1, so c1 times j times c2 times j becomes negative c1 times c2. i times j equals 1, so b1 times i times c2 times j becomes b1 times c2. j times i equals negative 1, so c1 times j times b2 times i becomes negative c1 times b2. After simplifying everything, the final result is a1 times a2 minus b1 times b2 minus c1 times c2 for the real part, plus a1 times b2 plus b1 times a2 plus c1 times b2 times i, plus a1 times c2 plus c1 times a2 minus b1 times c2 times j. This proves that mocabions are closed under multiplication. To determine if mocabions form a division algebra, we define the modulus or norm. The modulus squared is equal to m times its conjugate. The conjugate of a mocabion a plus b times i plus c times j is a minus b times i minus c times j. When we multiply m by its conjugate, we get a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Taking the square root gives us the modulus, the square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared. To find the inverse of a mocabion, we divide its conjugate by the modulus squared. So the inverse is a minus b times i minus c times j divided by a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Since the modulus squared is always positive for non-zero mocabions, they do indeed form a division algebra. Multiplying by i or j introduces rotations, similar to what happens with complex numbers and quaternions. For example, if we multiply a mocabion by i, we get i times a plus b times i plus c times j, which expands to a times i minus b plus c. This suggests a structured rotation along an axis. Similarly, multiplying by j rotates in a different direction. Unlike quaternions, which encode hyperspherical rotations, mocabions exhibit a cube-like rotational structure in 3D space. We just built a 3D number system that Hamilton never found, mocabions. But this is just the beginning. What happens if we extend this concept to five dimensions? In the next video, we'll introduce Quintinians, a five-dimensional number system built on the foundation of Mocabions. Subscribe now, because we're just getting started.